Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over coronary artery disease. Now, this video is specifically for the PN VN student. However, if you are an RN student, this video will still be helpful to you. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And be sure to check out my website. I have audio lessons available, next generation NCLEX reviews that you can sign up for private tutoring and one-on-one -on -one consultation sessions. You can find all that information by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. Coronary artery disease. All right, first question, which part of a patient's history is the biggest factor for the development of coronary artery disease? Would it be drinking socially? Would it be having a history of mitral valve repair? Would it be having a history of rheumatic fever as a child or obesity? What part of a patient's history would be the biggest factor in developing coronary artery disease? Guys, remember the coronary artery, that is a vessel that brings oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself. Remember, all your organs need blood, including your heart. That's right, obesity, because obesity is more often than not linked with what? Hyperlipidemia, that what's that? High cholesterol. And as you guys know, high cholesterol, that's one of the leading causes of heart disease, of coronary artery disease. Very good. When a patient asks about how cholesterol can increase the cardiac risk factors, the best explanation is that hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol, expands the circulating blood volume, it narrows the lumen of the arteries, it slows the clotting of blood, or it causes tachycardia. What's the best explanation of the link between hyperlipidemia and coronary artery disease? Very good. It narrows the lumen of the arteries. So it thickens those um, lining of the arteries. You have all of this uh, fat, this plaque, right? That all of that um, cholesterol gets hardened and it sticks to the inner lining of the arteries, making it more narrow. So what happens as that um, lumen becomes more narrow, the blood flow slows down. Now, remember, this is supposed to be oxygenated blood. This is oxygenated blood that's supposed to be going to the heart to, to perfuse the heart. It's being slowed down because of the narrowing of the lumen, okay? And so that's that's what um, the that connection is because think about it. Your cholesterol is high. It sticks to the lumen. It narrows the lumen. It slows down oxygenated blood going to feed the heart muscle, and that ends up causing what? The patient's going to have angina. Angina is that chest pain. That's the, the body's screaming, help, help, I need oxygen. And the reason that oxygen is so low is because, again, the blood has slowed down because what? That lumen has narrowed. All right, what healthy alternative would help comply with a low cholesterol diet? right? You want a healthy heart, the patient's going to be on a low cholesterol diet, which would help? Would it be wheat toast instead of white toast? Would it be margarine instead of butter? Would it be eggs instead of cereal? Or would it be ham for sausage? Okay, very good. Uh, a lot of you on the live, I saw a lot of you on the live said blue. You guys chose margarine for butter. But guys, margarine, eggs, ham, still high in what? Cholesterol, right? So out of these choices, your best is going to be um, um, wheat toast instead of white toast. which is an adverse reaction of a torvastatin that must be reported immediately. Is it palpitations? Is it visual changes? Is it weight loss or is it muscle pain? By the way, guys, you need to know the statins of torvastatin. This is um, an anti-hyperlipidemia agent and there's some serious adverse reactions that you do have to know about, one specifically.
Very good. Muscle pain. What are we concerned about? It starts with an R. You have to know that R word. Matter of fact, this concept, you get that for LPN, you get that for RN. And if you're studying to be a nurse practitioner, this comes back to haunt you again. So you absolutely must know it. And the correct answer is rhabdo mind lysis. Okay. Rhabdo. So what happens is in rhabdo, um, this medication adverse reaction, it can cause breakdown of muscle tissue. Now that breakdown of muscle tissue patient will have myoglobin floating in the blood. And then what happens is it can cause some serious damage to um, the organs, especially um, the kidneys. Patient can have muscle pain. Usually they'll uh, complain of muscle pain in the calf. If the patient's on an, a statin medication and they're reporting muscle pain in the calf or anywhere for that matter, you're gonna tell that patient to come in immediately, not to take that medication, don't take the next dose, come in immediately so they can be assessed because that patient will need to be assessed for a rhabdo because guess what guys, this is life threatening. It can kill the patient. Which is the best pharmacological measure for a patient with angina pectoris? I said pharmacological, I meant non-pharmacological. Which is the best non-pharmacological measure for a patient that's having angina pectoris, that's the chest pain? Would it be for them to take a deep breath? Would it be for them to rest in a chair? Would it be for them to apply a cold cloth to the chest? Or would you teach them to take a brisk 15 minute walk? If they're having angina pectoris, they're having chest pain, what is the best non-pharmacological measure? Very good. Rest. Whatever you are doing, whatever activity you are doing, stop it and rest. Here's what happens, guys. The more that you move about, the more your metabolic um, rate increases, the more your oxygen, oxygen demand increases, right? So if you're moving around, you need more oxygen to feed the tissues. So if the person has heart disease, they got all this plaque that's narrowed the lumen, there's hardly any oxygenated blood going to the heart and they're moving about, which means that their need for oxygen has decreased, they may have chest pain. That chest pain is the heart screaming for oxygen that it's not getting, right? So what's the first thing you're gonna have the patient do? Stop moving, rest. Because the minute they rest, they decrease the need for oxygen and that should help decrease that pain that they're, that they're experiencing, okay? So that's the first thing you're gonna teach them to do. Whatever activity they're doing, stop and rest. You wanna decrease the demand for oxygen. All right, which statement about sublingual nitroglycerin confirms understanding of the teaching that's been provided? Is it, I will take the tablet between the gum and cheek. I will put the tablet in the back of my mouth. I will put the tablet under my tongue or I will chew the tablet. Which statement about sublingual nitroglycerin confirms that the patient has understood the teaching that you just provided about sublingual nitroglycerin? Very good. I'll put the tablet under my tongue. Sublingual, that means under the tongue, right? Now, um, nitroglycerin, this is a wonderful medication. We love it when it comes to um, angina pectoris. We love it when it comes to coronary um, artery disease if the patient's acutely showing symptoms because what is uh, nitroglycerin? It's a vasodilator. So remember how a big problem is that the lumen of the artery is narrowed. Blood's not flowing through. Well, nitroglycerin causes the vessel to what? Dilate so more oxygenated blood can flow through, okay? So if you're teaching about sublingual nitroglycerin, you're teaching about taking nitroglycerin where? Under the tongue. Select all that applies. Which symptoms are most closely associated with the use of nitroglycerin tablets? Select all that, all that apply. Here are your choices. Headache, Confusion, dry mouth, sweating, dizziness, flushing. I see you guys being nasty in the comments. Stop. <laughs> you guys are terrible.
All right. So most of you, a lot of you guys got the headache correctly. Um, just think about whenever you're asked about um, a side effect of a medication, I want you to think about what that medication does. Okay. And it will give you an idea of what side effect the patient may have. Remember, I told you this is a vasodilator. Okay. So it caused vasodilation. You have a a flushing of, um, I should use the word flushing, but um, you have lots of blood rushing to the area that it needs to go. Yes, it can cause a headache, that congestion of blood. Yep. It can cause headache, dizziness, because remember, it's a vasodilator, right? So what can happen to the blood pressure? That blood pressure can drop. Patient can feel dizzy and flushing. Absolutely. These are side effects of the medication. And what you're going to do, there's a difference between side effect and adverse effect, guys. This is very important. I know many often, oftentimes we use it interchangeably, but they're really not the same thing. Side effects of medications are things that may possibly happen when the patient takes the medications. And so you warn them that it can happen so they don't freak out if it happens. They don't stop taking their medication if it happens. Adverse effects are things that may happen when a patient takes the medication, but under no circumstances do we want it to happen. And we warned them, if you experience any of these, let us know right away. We're going to have to bring you in. Maybe the doctor's going to change the medication. Who knows? But we don't want this to happen. So there is a difference. Now, the headache, dizziness, flushing, these are side effects. These are things that may possibly happen when the patient takes the medication. Um, most likely, there, there will be... Um, no changing of the dosage, um, but we warn them, hey, this may um, happen if you take the medication. We may do uh, teaching in regards to the side effects, okay? So make sure you guys know the side effects of nitroglycerin and the nursing interventions regarding those side effects. You have to know both. Which information will be a sign that the nitroglycerin tablet needs to be replaced? What would be a sign that, okay, this medication is no longer effective? It's not working. It needs to be replaced. Here are um, your choices. The tablets smell like vinegar. The tablets are discolored. The tablets don't cause a tingling sensation. The tablets disintegrate when touched. Wow, only two of you guys chose the correct answer. So let me explain this to you. Nitroglycerin is supposed to burn. It's supposed to, I wrote the tingly, but you know, sometimes it may be described as a burning sensation or a tingly sensation or a fizzing sensation, but they're supposed to feel something, okay? They're supposed to get that sensation once they place that tablet under the tongue. If there's absolutely nothing, that medication is probably old, it's expired, it's not working, it's not effective, it needs to be replaced. Okay, that's very important. You guys need to know that. Which is the most appropriate fat for cooking? If you have to use it, which would be most appropriate? Would it be melted margarine? Would it be a clarified butter? Would it be solid shortening? Or would it be liquid corn oil? Very good, liquid corn oil. So liquid corn oil is a polyunsaturated fat. If you have to use a fat, you want to use a polyunsaturated fat that comes from a vegetable, you know, such as corn. You don't want to use um, um, saturated fat, such as a margarine or butter. So that's why liquid corn oil is the correct answer, because if you have to use a fat, at least make sure it's polyunsaturated fat coming from a vegetable. All right, an allergy to which substance increases the risk when undergoing a cardiac catheterization? Would it be penicillin? Would it be morphine? Would it be shellfish or eggs? An allergy to which substance would increase the risk of a patient undergoing a cardiac cath? Very good. Shellfish. Usually people who are allergic to shellfish, 
they're allergic to iodine and iodine is used in the contrast media when the patient's going undergoing a cardiac cath for visual visualization of blood flow through those um, vessels, right? So we're going to have a problem if that patient needs a cardiac cath, but they're allergic to shellfish, further testing is going to be needed because again, that radiopaque dye that's being used has what? Iodine in it. All right, guys, last question. In what position would you maintain the patient's leg after a cardiac cath? Would it be extended? Would it be flexed? Would it be abducted or would it be adducted? In what position would you maintain the patient's leg after a cardiac cath? All right, very good, extended, just like you saw in the picture. Usually that insertion site is gonna be that femoral artery. We're going to want that leg extended. We don't want any flexion. We want it to stay straight and it has to stay like th that for at least six to eight hours. You have to avoid flexing um, that area where the insertion site is. So the correct answer is extended. You guys did a great job. Let's see who won this Kahoot. <laughs> 